Hello, I'm Lisa DeHart and welcome to the coaching studio. Today in the studio is my guest, Tara Nolan. She is a MCC with the International Coaching Federation and my privilege to have you on the show as a guest. Thank you, Tara. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, Lisa, thank you very much. I'm delighted. I'm very, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. First of all, I have to just say, I love your accent. So, you know, um, <laughs> It's so funny. We never think we have an accent. Like I don't think. Uh, we have an accent, so, yeah, I know. But I hear the uh, the Irish lilt, and it and it makes me happy. So <laughs> I would love to hear a little bit about sort of what were what was the the journey or flow of your your I don't know evolution into coach becoming a coach and and coaching in general. Yeah, and it's funny. You, all, I always am slightly nervous that I haven't canned this answer too too much, and it becomes a little bit boring to myself and to others. But um, I suppose what I, you know, when I was in university and I studied economics, I genuinely didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. And um, you know, and I fell into investment banking and liked it for a lot of the trappings it afforded me like the money and, um, <laughs> that's a nice to, trapping yes <laughs> yeah, and the ability to spend but I think my soul was a little dead and um and I still didn't know even from there and this is the part of my story that most people get interested in even though sometimes I don't but I um dated a South African accountant who was working for Morgan Stanley the, the investment banking firm I was with and it was his dream to, the go, to go to the Cayman Islands and become a scuba diving instructor and open his own shop. And it was my folly to follow him. So, you know, <laughs> I was led by the heart, believing that this was my soulmate, and it turned out not to be the case. But I spent two years in the Cayman Islands, and I guess what I learned there was what I didn't want. And uh, I didn't want the repetitive, you know, as much as the backdrop was beautiful, but the repetitive conversations, the same life, you know, day in, it was like Groundhog Day in a very beautiful setting. And, um, you know, things like, and you, uh, people, uh, you know, Gen Zs will be listening to this and going, what's she talking about? But CD-ROMs came out, I had no clue. Like, I didn't have any idea. Anyway, after two years, I, you know, I fell out of the Cayman Islands and found myself in New York City. And it was a very fortuitous find because I started headhunting or in the, the realm and domain of headhunting. And that was very interesting for for a while. Shifted um, the conversation for sure. Uh, for sure. And, you know, and I was in the heady world of, of um, you know, New York City, the frenetic world of New York City, the vibrancy of that city. I still love it. I love it for all of its quirkiness and oddness and its energy and its difference and possibility. And it was certainly a million miles faster than the Cayman Islands. And I guess that also excited me. It was very different and the possibilities were endless. Um, and I was lucky I got this role and job and I was lucky in the assignments I got, et cetera, et cetera. And then after four years, my little sister had her first baby and I felt like I was removed from my family for a very long time. And I thought to come back to Europe. You know, if you ask me, have I any regrets? That probably is one regret that I left New York City and, you know, left my green card there. Um, because I really, really enjoyed a lot of America. And I know there's lots of story about America now, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I loved my experience. But I went I, back I'm here and I still love America, you know, yeah, even with all of its quirkiness. <laughs> I, I, I honestly loved my four years in America and I had another opportunity to be back there again. But coming back to, to um, Europe, I locked out again and the Celtic Tiger was booming and I got a, a role um, as head of executive search and selection in PricewaterhouseCoopers and I will say Morgan Stanley and PricewaterhouseCoopers were my two favorite cultures as organizations when I look back now and um, probably didn't fully appreciate them in the time but mm -hmm. still I got a huge amount of freedom huge amount of latitude to scope the role as I saw fit and I realized that that's actually part of my values as well. The independence, the freedom, the fairness and equity by which they, you know, you know, acknowledge people, et cetera. Yeah. May I interrupt you just real quickly? Because you've said a couple of things that I think I just I'm fascinated by. One is this the the not appreciating it when you were there, but the reality of 
the culture and how important that is. How has that really translated into the work that you do with organizations and teams? Because I know teams is a huge part of the work that you're doing. Well, culture is a huge discipline and it's a, a thing that I, I, I always attend to with teams and, and with organizations. And, um, you know, of course, values play a really significant role in, in terms of how a culture is is um, played out in an organization or on a team. And so are there particular values that are most useful to a healthy culture? Well, I think, you know, you would always encourage um, an organization to and or team to adopt their own values and, and have them knit you know, the purpose for which they exist and the mandate they're trying to serve. Right. Yeah. And of course there are, uh, and one actually guest of mine said there's, there are four values that, you know, you will see played out again and again. Um, and it would be customer centricity um, and customer focus would be a big one. You know, trust and integrity would, would be another, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then um, openness and honesty. Yeah, that transparency piece, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, every organization and team would like to think that they build their own, and they do, and a lot would be, you know, primed on on those four. I, I probably am bastardizing his... his well, and what's the fourth one? Because you, you had said... Um... What's the fourth one? What am I thinking? What's the fourth one? Care. Care, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some people talk about you know and care can look up you know be transposed as respect trust um but care is is a really big big one um and then other teams and um, have their own like mine are my own personal values are freedom fairness are they're they're my two hot ones and yeah. i would say creativity um is another yeah. um and fun yeah. my fourth you know um, and if I'm not really living in out of those four, then I'm in, you know, misaligned. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you want me to return to the journey. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I just was just fascinated by what you were sharing. And so, yes, please, please. Um, you were recognizing the value of that, those organizations that you had worked in. Yeah. And I guess, I, I suppose to speak to that, I think what, what, um, many of us are not really primed about in, in our formative um, education is how important culture and values are. And a lot of people talk about the work or they talk about the doing, but they forget actually that the climate and how people connect and relate, et cetera, are so important. So um, back to my story broadly, um, I was sitting sitting in Ireland and the, the SEC came down pretty heavy on accountancy firms recruiting. So I said, oh gosh, what next? And I did an MBA and through the MBA, um, it became very clear to me that the area and interest was sort of psychology, organizational development, mm -hmm. the human dimension of change. And so um, I remember sitting uh, in a cafe in, New in London and a lady said to me, you'd be very good as a coach. And I had no clue what the word was. Didn't, never heard of it. Nope, nope, had no idea. And so I investigated a little, not a lot, because that would be my style. And um, found myself um, in Colorado studying with Newfield. And it was ontological coaching. And that was where I really realized, aha, this is something I'm really fascinated by. And I guess it married with, you know, how do we help people get really in touch with who they are, what they're about, and how do they then connect into the relationships they're having with themselves and others, and then into the organizations and the teams they live to be more at ease, purposeful, et cetera. So that became my mission, you know, because I had felt kind of out of sync in a lot of ways with the organizations I was in you know, happy on those two cultural levels, but not necessarily happy with what I was doing and being in them. Yeah, I really heard you say that, you know, there was a sense of I appreciated the monetary benefits, but I was a bit dead inside is I think how you named that. How did, how did you, you know, come alive at, through that coaching training? Well, I, how I came alive was kind of appreciating, um, you know, how the, 
the epistemology works and how the human works and you know and how you know if we could just get under the hood of ourselves we could start begin to cultivate you know a richness and a fulfillment and tap into things so i came alive with this idea that more of us could be more at ease and more peaceful if we you know brought ourselves to places like coaching or mentoring or you know psychotherapy or other you know talking therapies to to support you know you know what's getting in our own way and and what could we do to shift and yeah. so i think i came alive there i came i you know got really inquisitive really acquisitive in terms of the kind of books and courses i took so I did ontological coaching, I did gestalt coaching, I did Nancy Klein's Time to Think coaching. And then in 2014, I did team coaching. And um, and I found that, another word I love, you know, it, the messiness of teams and kind of knitting all of that together and the complexity inherent in a team, not just by the members alone and the personalities um, um, and all their histories, but then the work and connecting that and making sense of all of that. So I really love that work. So now I find myself really engaged in individual coaching, executive coaching, mostly at board level and senior executive level and team coaching and mostly again at top team level coaching. Um, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. What a what a fascinating journey. What a you know, and everybody does have such an interesting map of their progress towards where they end up in this moment. You know, it's just fascinating. As you were moving from a beginning coach, you know, you've taken this course, you're like, yeah, I think I've hit on what I'm going to enjoy for quite a while, maybe not forever, but for quite a while. What was that journey then towards MCC? Like what drove you towards an MCC? What was your, what was kind of your, I don't know. I'm going to just stop talking. (laughs) I think initially what drove me towards it was getting it. <laughs> what 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 I was immediately met with in the pursuit of it was being it. Um, oh, and- I love that. It's true though, right? Like, I mean, it's there's this driving, like I want to have it, and then there's this, oh, it's going to take a bit more than that. Absolutely, and I was extraordinarily fortunate. I had a mentor coach in the guise of Janet Harvey. And I absolutely loved the process. So I guess I fell in love with coaching. She was one of my mentor coaches too. I should just have so much respect for for, um, Janet. And, you know, she helped me really equip myself with the idea of the being of MCC and MCC-ness and claiming that for myself, claiming my own authority in it as opposed to what do I do now, Janet, or what, you know, all the ways, the technical ways that we think we're going to master this. And I think I had a very wobbly three-legged stool. So I was very, if I call it, fixated on competency and mastering the, you know, ICF competencies. But I was less indexed, if you will, on the idea of partnering and presence. Mm -hmm. it was though in those two areas that I really had to develop this yeah. idea of what would it look like if you actually partnered with your client. And what and does that, it look like when you partner with a client? I think you have to go back to basics and with the ICF definition and really trust that the client is already, you know, whole and resourceful and wise, and they can figure things out in your presence. I think the idea that I don't have to work as hard um and or harder than the client um you know was quite the learning for me to to back off and to genuinely you know be in and I didn't really know what that meant stance with the client I really didn't know what that that was I felt it was a little jargonistic but that idea of you know where are you now client what's happening now you know Mm -hmm. you know moving with them as opposed to being two steps ahead of them or two steps behind. Mm -hmm. So I really, really, um, I guess, immersed myself in a three-legged stool um, and equipped myself to be more present to myself and the other, um, to be curious about what might be missing if there was, to partner and really think about that and what that might mean for me. And one of the ways, you know, there's some, some tips I would also think sometimes I think we can get really attached to all of the content a client is saying and you know yeah, like the story the, the details yeah. 
And I'm, I'm kind of listening now just for energy. You know, what word really springs out to me that I could be curious about to see what, you know, am I picking something up and being curious about that? Or noticing the feminology, you know, a client just takes a deep inhale and moves backwards. Mm. What's that? You yeah, know, what just happened? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that really speaks to what you're, you mentioned a minute ago, which is not working so hard, like not working so hard to figure out what's the best next question, but rather fully being present and just noticing what is actually happening in this space with two people. What is that inhalation of breath? What, what just happened there? What is in the silence? What are these, um, you know, what are you hearing yourself say that is important to explore further or acknowledge right like it doesn't have to be complicated absolutely not absolutely not you know i heard myself say to a client on friday in a very noisy cafe and i wouldn't be encouraging people to try and coach in very noisy cafe (laughs) (laughs) what (laughs) Um, but i i heard myself say to him and you know you know what's your process for doing this today today you know like i don't think he'd ever heard that question asked of him you know and so there was me demonstrating partnering. Like, I don't, you mm. know, maybe you think I'm going to lead you through some kind of process. I'm going, no, what's yours? And how would you like to explore this? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was um, reading a research paper recently on, and it was for psychotherapy. It wasn't for um, coaching specifically, but I think it applies perfectly. Uh, the difference between outcomes with clients leading versus the therapist leading or the coach leading right and what outcomes were and I mean it's pretty it's pretty interesting just how you can see such a process shift with the agency that a person feels when they have that that empowered that empowerment that a coach can offer by asking the questions but not telling the answers yeah yeah and how you know, invidious the seduction trap is, you know, when clients go, what do you think? Or what, what's what would you do? (laughs) Exactly. You, you you must know the answer. Totally. Or, you know, or it's even more invidious than that. You know, um, I don't have the right question. And then you're tripped into, Oh, what about this? It's like, no, back up, back up, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think that's a really interesting question too, because I think that is sort of, not okay that's weak language it is part of that evolution of letting go of our expertise and this seems to come up in almost every single one of these interviews is that everybody in some form or another is learning how to let go of that need to to know um and to really be present with the person that's in front of them um what allows like what allows you to do that, to be that present with another person? I think you have to change your relationship to value um, and shift the relationship you're in with value because I find a lot, and I do mentor coaches as well. I find a lot of um, coach coaches um, think that to give value, they need to demonstrate expertise or to give value, they need to you know bring and drag clients through a process Mm -hmm. Um, and I think if you re-relate the value of presence and space and that space to think and think for yourself may be prompted by one question three questions but I think you know you know stepping off the pedestal and thinking I must ask the brilliant question or the best question having all these superlatives Mm -hmm. I think is is um important um yeah I, 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 I mean, I often will say, okay, that might not have landed as a question. What about this one? You <laughs> know, try this yeah. one. See if this works, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not or, really or is there question. a better question that I'm not asking? <laughs> yeah, to- totally. Or what's the question you'd ask yourself if you were in my situation? You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- that's a that's that's a thing, and it may be a trap that I find coaches get into. You know, equating. Um, expertise with value yeah i i think that's a a huge part of it is and and i love that you stated it like that because i think that is a very a thoughtful but also somewhat intentional actionable sort of in 
intention, right? Of uh, how, what is my relationship with that, my own value? Because until we do that work of like, my value is determined by you liking me, you thinking I'm great, you being successful, until we can let go of that, we are in that sort of trap of now I've got to work really hard so that you can do all those things like me, be successful, whatever. And I mean, that's great, I guess, if, um, you know, I, I liken it to this, like if I'm building a chicken coop, I want your expertise. <laughs> like If you've done it before me, please tell me how much uh, wood I need to buy and how I need, like I need your, the design layout, the schematic, you know, so that I can gather eggs and chickens can be safe and all that sort of stuff. But when it comes to most of the things that our clients are working through, it is never the surface topic they tend to bring forward. It really isn't the over full schedule. It's like what's driving you to take on so much, right? So that being present with somebody else in that way. What is something about coaching that you that you thought when you started, but that is shifted through time with your experience? And if you don't like that question, I you can tell me what's the better question. No, it's a great. I, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> I I I think. The, those two thoughts earlier, the, the fact that I never really appreciated the impact of my presence and I never, and the energy, et cetera, et cetera, and the impact of that. Um, so I wasn't attentive to my way of being might not be serving. So, you know, if I batter somebody with questions, which I have, I'm a very able questioner, you know? <laughs> so, so if I, you know, I don't mean stacking questions now, but just, the speed at which I can, um, it can be very alienating just to be really conscious of, you know, sensing and being curious about what might be working or even asking the client what works, what will they need, etc. Um, so I think that, I think, you know, um, I think I really learned the competency, um, you know, the coaching client agreement, you know, about which I became really good because of just realized how important it is to really remove all the noise and the clutter and to get at what is meaningful, what's at cause or at risk here? What is it so important to you that you'd really love to spend some time, you know, chewing over? Um, and, you know, being with the concerns that clients have. And then, and then you know, as much as it, I used to say to Janet, oh, it's a bit clunky, you know, trying to bookend that and going, what does success look like? And, you know, what do we need to address? But I think there's a lovely, there's a lovely cleanness about that. Um, and I really, really liked the arc of a coaching conversation. And when you do apply the competencies, you know, because we're not dancing around for hours, you know, we're getting really clear, actually, something is that cause for me, something is a topic about which I have no idea what I really want. But broadly, I have a sense that it'd be this. Yeah. And I have an inkling that I need to address this. Um, and then other stuff surfaces. So I think the coaching competency number three and getting really good at that, the agreement um, is something that, yeah, I, I really appreciate. I think I was overly indexed on questions and powerful questions and mm -hmm. trapped by the seductive nature of that, you know, you know, a hundred best questions or a hundred. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no. Some, you know, that sometimes the, the simplicity of what's that much it's more all you need. Yeah. 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 What else? You know? Well, and it's funny as you say this, cause you know, I, I hear from people, I mean, you listen to a lot of coaching calls, I'm sure, you know, as you're doing mentoring, I know I do also, and I'm, 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 I'm continually reminding people agreement setting is coaching. You know, like, I mean, it's still yes. coaching. What do you think is it is about like, and I find it with facilitating client growth also, like, what do you think it is about those two competencies that has people kind of like, I don't want to like really dive into that as much. What do you think that's about? It's really a really interesting question. And I absolutely concur with you. I think I was allergic to those two. The, the, the <laughs> I know I was. <laughs> and the finish, and it's like, ugh. It, feels, it felt, I remember saying the word I used to keep saying to Janet was clunky. I felt as if I was, you know, 
being belligerent in my fact finding and my you know discovery in that first question and then I was being maybe a little trite in the you know what are you going to do now you know uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was kind of feeling oh the awareness is it you know and it is but it's how do you materialize the awareness to actually do something different with yourself so I, I had to reframe my relationship with those two and really fall in love with this idea if I could really help clients see the value of getting at something meaningful that would be sustainable over time and maybe in different domains for them that would be helpful um and the more i practiced the more i got with that the you know the more that became evident um and what was the other thought i had the other thought i i had was um i i i have a a lot of mentor coaches who think it is as a collapsed expectation when i do the coaching agreement then i'll start coaching And I say, as soon as the frame opens, if you're working on Zoom, or as soon as you meet your client in a cafe, noisy as it is, you are coaching. (laughs) You know, you you are in a relation. And and I remember nearly having a fight with somebody about this, where I was the mentor, and they were saying, and I said, no, that's a beautiful opportunity. They they yawned. They yawned in your face. So that's coaching. (laughs) What's what's showing up right now? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and they were waiting for the yawn to finish and then they, you know, and well, like, and then they needed to direct the conversation towards something lively so that the client could, you know, get out of whatever that experience was they were having. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's so funny because I really struggled with the, the, those two as well. And I think, um, you know, I, I love this idea that you brought forward is I think there is a lot in coaching and, and I, and so I'm going to throw this out here because I, I'm curious what your thoughts are, but I think there's a lot in coaching where like through the process of, of um, developing an appreciation for, you know, agreement setting and for facilitating client growth. And I have to tell you, I struggled, I would struggled with agreement setting, but I really struggled with facilitate or nine, 10 and 11 at that time, but facilitating client growth because I felt so parentified, like, what are you going to do? When are you going to get it done by? How are you going to hold yourself accountable? Like it just felt very, um, parental. And I remember talking to one of my other mentor coaches, Jan Berg, and she said to me, what do your clients think? And I had never even asked that question of myself, Yeah, (laughs) right? Like, I don't know what my clients think of it. So I started asking what my clients thought at the end of the coaching about some of these things that I was feeling uncomfortable about. And like a hundred percent of them were like, oh, it was great. (laughs) which was like <clears throat> I know I for, uh, Jan is fabulous I love Jan Berg um but I, I also found that you know it it's it's that that piece about you know you are responsible for your life client you are responsible and accountable for what you choose to do from here yeah. and I think it's facilitating that is what we're doing yeah. we're not making them do it we're facilitating that and I think the other thing that I loved when it was done to me, when, you know, with my, when, when I'm being coached is it kind of makes me sit up and go, Oh God, what am I going to do? You know, yeah. how am I going to get distracted? Who could I ask for support? You know, cause I'm thinking this is all mine to solve. Or what internally do I have to support myself? Yeah. Whatever that is. Uh, absolutely. And I, you know, I think they're personally now, I think of them as beautiful bookends, mm-hmm. um, not I as well. I appreciate your perspective though. So thank you for sharing that because I think, I think those are two competencies that most people overlook the most because everybody really enjoys asking all those like questions in the middle and evoking awareness and, you know, all of that. And, and I, I often think, you know, if you don't support the client to prime the direction, then then how will you even know you could have a fabulous conversation it could be really impactful but how much more impactful could it have been if it was actually what the client really wanted to explore um because sometimes i think we explore things that the client's like yeah that was really good like i hadn't thought about that but it would have they would have had maybe more of what they needed if they had uh just you know been asked what they wanted to do what is um, something that you discovered about yourself on this journey that that was surprising? 
think it was gifted to me by Janet, um, and I'm not sure I'd fully appreciated it, it myself, but my intuition um, mm. and honoring that and, um, it, you know, that, that, and others have said it to me, I've, you know, I have, I, I work with colleagues on a, on a supervision program and they've said, gosh, you're laser like, and you get at the, the root cause so ably and, and quickly. So I have a, I have a good knack and sense of intuition and I don't often honor that in me you know you know so just trusting that and then what I am good at which I loved and I was disappointed that the ICF took them away as a competency but I used to love competency six in the old man <laughs> direct communication because I would then use that intuition to inform my direct communication and it worked uh, you know not that I was right I don't mean work that way but it really Oh yeah, that's that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I wonder what we can do with that. And um, here's what I'm sitting with. Here's what's got being activated in me. I wonder what's yeah. going on for you, plant. Um, I think it's still available to you in the new competencies. Um, you know, under shares without attachment. Um. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But I just I'm calling out like yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I mean, so, but I would just say, I mean, I can't even imagine that 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 wouldn't still be super beneficial for your clients because I think that we do have that perspective right from outside of the attachment to the situation where we have that experiential instinct that's showing up for us to share lightly, you know, not with attachment, but lightly to share with the client. So um, I'm, I imagine your clients are still very much benefiting from your direct communication. Well, I, I, it hasn't stopped me. Let's put it back. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um if if the seats were flipped and and you were if I was if the if the let me try this again if the seats were flipped and you were asking yourself a question what question would be useful for you to be asked at this moment? It's a lovely question. Um, I noticed just even in me, uh, I can and I wonder is this how you're experiencing me? I can I can sometimes with the first question in my history I think it was a bit long winded but I can then in in terms of the coaching and the domain of coaching, I can sometimes give clipped answers, you know, and I'm wondering, mm -hmm. is there something about which I'm not speaking that you'd be really curious to learn? So that would be my question. Oh, so is there something about you that is not shown on the surface that we would really benefit from knowing about you as a human being? Well, I think, yes, I think I can come off as, you know, um, direct, uh, quick, analytical, um, and I am completely soft inside. Like I have a center and a sensitivity that I'm not sure many people meet first. They meet the hard, driven, you know, determined, clever me. Um, and so, you know, certainly strong back, but soft belly. I don't think people know that of me. Yeah, I, I will, if, if, if it's okay for me to share an observation with you, I have only experienced the strong back, soft belly piece of you in today's conversation. So I haven't felt any of this clipped analytical pushing oh. away just as a, a an outside observation uh, that has not been my experience of you at all um you know as as is i'm curious what are the things that you are really focusing your attention on now in your coaching like where is your energy being drawn towards um i think a lot of my energy is definitely still drawn to team coaching and not perfecting it but getting comfortable with communicating what it is um helping clients to understand what it is and could be um i still think there's a lot of confusion around team coaching um and clients and team coaches themselves you know and i you know and then there are others that what the hell is that why is it important to have a definition of all well I think it is because I think we can get ourselves confused if we're believing we're going to get this and then we actually get that. Um, what is your definition of team coaching? 
Yeah, so I believe that my definition, and it's still evolving, but I think my definition of, of, of team coaching is enabling and equipping the team to pull out their strengths in service of the purpose they say they're in, you know, serving clients for or stakeholders for, you know, so that they can collaborate, co-create um, together. And that's, I, I try and champion that in, in my work. And so what that looks like then is, you know, helping a client to get really clear what's important to us. What is it? Why do we exist? What are we here to deliver? What are our expectations of each other? What are the relational quotients that we need to work on? You know, the elements that really will help us like trust, respect, concerns, moods, you know, um, appreciation. How can we really drop the armor that so many team individuals come with and really get, you know, on board with this idea of teaming and mm -hmm. working together on a few things that only we can do together? Um, and what do we have to let go to do that? And so, you know, often it's about, honestly, often it's about team members really getting to know each other, like knowing each other's strengths, not just a nice to know each other, but really knowing what's the contribution that each member wants to make. Mm -hmm. and, and and really calling out derailing behaviors, you know, getting really good at doing that upfront and then mm -hmm. finding out each personal interest and then moving into the team space, you know, when we're viewing the team and being willing to say what's working, what isn't working and helping the team to foster optimism because it's so easy to be denigrating, you know, shooing away, et cetera, but to really encourage because it's not, e it's not, not easy work. It's tr tricky work. And then being proactive, what are the few things that we want to dial up and move forward? And then I think it's about also, you know, sitting in your context and being really clear how the system is enabling or disabling this team to work. And, yeah. and, and then getting ultimately by doing all of that, you know, psychological safety, you know, team identity and delivering outcomes that really matter. And that's a healthy, heavy agenda. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, it's reminding me sort of like family systems, you know, thinking without the family, but, but the same sort of the processes of like, how, how do we, how are we going to be together? And, and, you know, I'm even hearing like the agreement setting, like, how are we going to be with each other? How do we create safety so that we can say to somebody that didn't land so well, or I have a different idea, or let's hear all the ideas and not just, you know, the one extroverted voice in the room or whatever. Um, and I, I really, I really appreciate that sense of like, there's, there's so much more to it than just the goal at the end of the, like, this is what we've got to, this is our, we have to meet this goal. Like how, right? How do we want to meet this goal? How will we be with each other as we do that? Yeah. I think it really is, you know, getting very clear. What's our why, you know, who are we? And then, then, how and what you know but it's you know the, the speed at which teams go through the how and what and forget the why and who um and so but i do genuinely employ the individual now there are team coaching competencies thank god but you know i was employing the individual um, competencies that set yeah. down by the rcf to support my coaching and i did also wrap my team coaching with some facilitation and some educative pieces too because sometimes the, the teams yeah. are just not there, you know, right. and, you know, but they identi self-identify and I'll help them um, then by offering what I offer. Um, so, yeah, but it's, it is, an, so when you say, where is my, it's, it's focusing on getting a, getting a way of speaking that in a way that is clear and compelling, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to confusing. Yeah. Well, and, and I really appreciate also the fact that it really takes us back to where in, in the earlier part of our conversation around the, the value of the culture in which you are working and how that impacted, you know, it impacts your capacity as a, as a team to be successful, but it also impacts just the way you show up as a human being with other human beings. When the culture of your organization supports a healthy team right oh oh absolutely and just being aware of that you know to be be mm -hmm. curious about how the system may be preventing the operation of this team you know and, and yeah well, 
And that really uh, has me kind of curious because, you know, I've, I've, I too have worked with teams. I, I came from a therapy background though. So I've done a ton of family um, systems work, but, um, but one of the thoughts that I'm always curious about when, when I'm observing team coaching and, or doing any kind of team coaching is if you're working with, like, I heard you're working with like the executive and C-suite teams, these higher teams, what I see often though, is that they're not doing the teamwork and the smaller teams are doing like the, the teams at the lower levels are doing the teamwork, but then they don't have that infrastructure. So how does it, how does it support and serve an organization to really have the C-suite and the upper directors and executives be in team coaching? How does that oh, serve? question i think first of all i do actually think that there is in the way in the world we have there are some um reasons to think of a leadership team as being a team a genuine team with some clear critical chunky um interdependent goals that they can only work on together i do think that's that's true because otherwise they'll be a group and they'll just be against their functional remits and they'll keep that sort of siloedness of them but i think when you do bring the material of team coaching to a top team what is beautiful is that it ripples down mm -hmm. or you can support it being rippling down or indeed you can think about the idea of team of teams and you know but i think the languaging is really helpful when people get clear that oh gosh it is smart that we don't assume what our you know stakeholders want of us it's good if we ask them isn't it yeah that might work and <laughs> it's really helpful if we think about not just having a purpose as you know, words on wallpaper, but actually a purpose that's meaningful to us, that's consequential, that's clear, about which we can get aligned. And gosh, wouldn't it be really good if we created our own culture and started thinking about the kinds of behaviors we'd love to see exhibited more and more. And then how about actually being very smart? And I mean, I'm using smart deliberately about the few must win battles we say that we must win together. Yeah. Finally, which I don't think a lot of teams do a lot of, and in fact, I think it's fairly bereft across organizations, is learning together. How do we give each other feedback? How do we speak and, yeah. and share what we think the other could be, you know, derive some benefit from learning? How do we learn as a collective? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and I think it takes a degree of um, courage to receive feedback that isn't always positive. And I mean, I just, have, I mean, just through the years, you know, my own relationship with feedback has shifted. I think that's part of the MCC journey also. Like my relationship with feedback is completely different. I used to be like, oh, I don't want it. Um, I do, but I don't. And now I'm like, bring it on, you know, which is a very different sort of perspective to be in. And I think that um, it takes a, it takes that to your point, you know, the, maybe you need to work one on one with somebody a little bit in a team also so that they have the capacity to hear feedback without personalizing it and to and actually get the value. Yeah, I think you're speaking a very important. I, too, in my MCC days, I remember Janet asked me, you know, you know, what might you be sitting on or thinking about? And I said, my fear of getting feedback is crippling me at the moment mm -hmm. when I first started, you know, and then I shifted my relationship to to feedback. And, you know, I welcomed challenge. I welcomed critique, not mm -hmm. of me, but of what I was doing. You know, doing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, I really, really hungered for it. I was delighted to receive it. So, yeah. you know, I think that's what I, I think that's what the gift of mentoring is. If we can help our mentees and our coaches to shift their relationship to, you know, feedback, feedback. and the same yeah. for teams to say absolutely you know yeah. have a pot like because otherwise i think we can get into a very sort of collusive com homogenized state right you know? and nobody wants to rock the boat and nobody yeah. wants to hurt anybody's feelings but that's the thing that's so hilarious right like why should your feelings be hurt because somebody asks you a question or disagrees with you <laughs> and a lot of it honestly is just not practiced you know we haven't been schooled to 
we have we've been schooled to get the right answer we haven't been schooled right. to really question and be curious um, yeah. And yeah it's kind of like the mindset with uh, carol dweck's work and that idea of you know if i can't do it perfectly i'm not gonna play or right. oh this is a puzzle and i'm gonna figure it out right like it, there are two very different ways of approaching a challenge and and i agree with you i think you know there's this sort of tension with hearing anything about myself that I, I might not have seen, A, mainly don't see, or B, I, I, I don't like about myself. So I try not to see it, right? And, um, and, and it's one of the reasons I really appreciate what you did a little bit earlier, which is kind of sharing sort of like, this is sometimes people experience me this way. I mean, and in fact, through that transparency, of, I, I didn't, I have none of that experience of you, which is so funny, right? As we name and just are transparent about our own self and our own experience of ourself, then then all of a sudden we, um, we've we shifted, if it was even there, which I didn't feel it, um, it certainly isn't afterwards, right? And, it, it and you know, it, that was born out of sort of, um, I came from Newfield where all emotions and having a very extended palette of emotions were accepted. Mm -hmm. What I find curious in coaching and especially with my, you know, mentees and coachees is a sort of a reluctance to be with emotions that are maybe un seemingly unsavory, like anger, guilt, mm -hmm. jealousy, right. hurt, you know, sadness. And it's like all of them are right. informed. They're in motion. They're about experience. So welcome them. Yeah, they teach you something. What is yeah. it that we need to learn from them? Yeah, I and I think it is, I, it, it may kind of go a little bit, I think, because coaching has been so, um, you know, thorough in no counseling. Like you're not a therapist, you're not a counselor. And so I think what people have done is said, well, emotions must be the the venue of therapists only, so we cannot talk about emotions, which I think is hilarious, given that we'll talk to our best friends about it, no problem, right? Yeah. Like, and we'll get curious with our best friends. So maybe start playing with your best friends. Like if they get emotional, get curious with them instead of, you know, align with them or fix it, you know, get curious with them so you can start that practice of what might be uncovered through the emotion versus just like, ah! I don't want to have anything to do with emotion because I, I agree with you. I see that too. The client will say something like it's scary and overwhelming and the coach will be like, so then by the end of the conversation, what would you like to talk about during this conversation? You know, like what would make it successful? Just totally stepping over what the client just offered. And I think it is that discomfort that the individual also has with maybe the role, but also with their own sense of those emotions since how many times have our clients come to us with our, you know, with our stuff floating in the space, right? And it's like, oh, what would I do? I don't know, right? You know, and it's like we, we are mirrored sometimes by our clients. Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah, this has been such a pleasure to have you on the show. So I have, um, I will be posting in links below so people can get a hold of you through LinkedIn, go to your website, um, all of that stuff. I'll also put a link into your podcast because I know you have the Team of Teams podcast and I think super exciting. And I think a lot of coaches are really excited about working with teams. And I think that would be a great podcast for people to hear. So I'll be uh, pointing people in the direction of your podcast also, as we're coming to a close, though, I, I, this is my question of this season. If you were writing your autobiography, Tara, what would you title it? And I don't we don't need an explanation or anything, but just what's the title of your your autobiography? You know, at 58 years of age, I um, one of my big, you know, hungers is learning. And I'd have to say still not done. Still not done. Beautiful. Oh, so much. I'm so happy. Thank you so much for being here um, today on the coaching studio. I have absolutely enjoyed your, your presence and this conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>